Hola. <laughs> Hola. Hola. Okay, so that's all of our Spanish language gone. And so the presentation is now going to be in English. Uh, and so we hope that if English is not your first language, you've got some translation in your ear. So what we're here to do is to talk to you about Digium products. Um, this is Steve. I'm David. And here's our brief agenda. So the whole point of this presentation is the fact that here at Digium, we have something for every Elastics person. We've got phones, gateways, the R series for redundancy. We've got a huge variety of cards to talk about. And on top of that, we've got software. But the most important point is at the bottom. Everything, yes, OK. Everything that we sell actually goes to help fund the development of Asterisk. Certainly not 100% of it. We are a, uh, uh, a commercial operation, but we're also responsible for somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of the development of Asterisk, including the maintenance of the, uh, the servers that you know, host Subversion, uh, the distribution of Asterisk, etc. And so every time somebody buys a Digium card, a Digium phone, or other Digium product, a percentage of that goes off to help fund the ongoing development of Asterisk, the inclusion of new features, the, uh, the development of new channel drivers, the addition of, uh, of nifty new technologies. And by the way, I'll have a presentation this afternoon at about uh, 6 p.m. talking about all of that. So again, we appreciate your business, and we appreciate your ongoing support of Asterisk and you know, helping maintain it as the, uh, the premier open source PBX platform. Yes, yeah, so when you buy a Digium product, you're actually helping to feed one of our developers in their little cages back at Digium. <laughs> OK. so. Uh, a few statistics about Asterisk. Um, in 2011, there was well over 2 million downloads. Now, when we say well over 2 million downloads, we're only talking about the downloads that we know about. If the guys from Debian have got an Asterisk repository or the guys from CentOS have got an Asterisk repository, we don't even know about those downloads. They're, they're yum installed or apt getted. But in terms of the downloads we know about, well over 2 million in 2011. In terms of people who have come along to asterisk.org and registered to participate in the community, there's more than 83,000 of them. So you can see we're talking about big numbers. But, but if you look right down at the bottom, just here, Elastics is a big part of our community. And that's why we're very, very pleased to be partnering with Palo Santo and to be telling you all about our products that work with Elastics. Now, thinking generally of the way Elastics is made up, what we need first is a, a distro, uh, or, or for a distro, we need a framework. And uh, we need a GUI. And if we look at the framework, of course, that's Elastics in this case. Elastics provides the framework for distribution, um, for controlling lots of things, but primarily asterisk. And it does that through a GUI called FreePBX. Uh, well, it does for now. It uses Asterisk as the communications engine. And then for the channel driver and the kernel driver for the cards that we use uh, in Elastics, then we can use Dardy. And of course, we're going to have an operating system. In this case, it's CentOS, but there are, there are other Linux flavors out there. The point I want to make with this particular picture is that we at Digium created those three things. We at Digium created the communications engine the channel driver and the kernel driver for using cards with asterisk. And therefore, the message I want to give you is if we created all three of those, then when it comes to selecting the cards for your deployment, wouldn't it be a good idea to select the Digium cards? Not only because you'll be feeding our developers, but also because they inherently glue in or fit in with all the other parts of the picture. May I hand to you now, please? Thank you, David. So, Digium, as uh, David said, is responsible for a large number of products that are sort of built on top of Asterisk. We started out, of course, with our card line. Uh, but in the last year, we've really expanded our other hardware offerings. So we're going to take a few minutes and kind of go through all of this, because it's both new and it's really exciting for the community of people that develop solutions based on top of Asterisk. And that, of course, includes Elastics. So David is holding up uh, one of our phones. We've actually got a booth back here. And you're certainly welcome to join and, and see them in action. These are the world's first phones that were built specifically and intentionally to work with Asterisk. They are standard SIP phones, make no, uh, no doubt of that. 
They'll work with any SIP compatible call control, but they do some special magic things with asterisks. So without too much further ado, let me kind of uh, walk through here. They are, again, the only phones designed for asterisk. We've built them, like asterisk, to be simple, customizable, and deeply integrated. And they really are intended to help people build value within UC systems. So people who are building unified communication solutions and choose to have a hardware endpoint, these are really designed to be the best value because they do more than just the average phone. So on the uh, design for asterisk point, um, they really do leverage the power of asterisk. They're connected uh, deeply within the system. So rather than just allowing you to script against them using uh, typical, you know, an extension that activates a feature, we're actually able to deeply tie the features between the user interface on the phone and the, uh, the internals of asterisk. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But and I was just going to mention the very good news that Palo Santo have been integrating them with Elastics while we speak. So that's a, a work going on. Absolutely. So um, this gives you extremely tight integration between the phone and the, uh, the endpoint. And it helps you control the end-to-end uh, -end experience of your users. So if you're developing solutions, or if you're just deploying stock Elastic solutions, this will still give you the best opportunity uh, to impress your customers and let them you know, do their jobs in a, an easier and faster way. I just did that for you. So, um, they're also a very good value. Um, competitive pricing, great margins. So if, if you're in the, uh, the business of selling phone systems, you can actually make some money on these, unlike a lot of other phones that are out there uh, on the market. Now, if you're in the, the business of using phones, uh, you can actually find them price, priced very competitively through all of the normal um, channels. Um, so I guess without too much further ado, let's talk about the different models. Since David is driving this, I'll let him take me on to the next slide. Hey. This is the D40, which is the model that David is holding right here. It is a two-line phone, which means there's actually two appearances, and it supports two separate SIP accounts. So you're able to connect it up to two separate SIP servers. It's got four uh, built-in hardware feature keys. Um, it's got four soft keys, um, a fairly good-sized uh, display, uh, and it supports all of the features that I'm going to talk about across this. Because it's smaller and it does not have a busy lamp field appearance set, some of those features are accessed in a slightly different fashion. This is really the value phone, the budget phone. Uh, it's priced at 129 US list, uh, and it's available for significantly discounted prices through various uh, um, resellers. So you're welcome to, of course, check that out. The mid-level phone, and again, there are three total models that we have available. Uh, is the D50. This actually doubles the number of line uh, appearance buttons and the number of SIP accounts that you can connect up to it. So you can connect up to a total of four different SIP uh, services with it. Uh, it's got six hard feature keys on it. And as you see on the right-hand side of it, it adds uh, a 10-button rapid dial panel, which has uh, 10 busy lamp fields slash speed dial buttons. Uh, the strip that you see there in this particular model is paper. So you're actually printing out uh, and inserting a DESI strip, they call it, a designation strip. Now, David, go down. I was just going to mention the handy utility for printing that strip out, because that can be a problem, can't it? Yes, built into every phone is a small web server. And from the web server, you can simply click a button, and it will generate a PDF of the full directory that goes into that DESI strip. So rather than having to white out and write in, you can actually print a nice clean copy anytime you make changes to your directory. So much nicer than most phones. We're on it. Ah, and here we are at the D70. The D70 is the executive level phone. It actually goes to six line keys. Um, it goes with a slightly larger LCD display. Uh, and you'll see over here the, uh, the um, uh, DESI strip has been replaced by an LCD panel. In this case, uh, it's an LCD panel that can show not just 10, but actually 100 separate contacts. Because if you notice the little blue buttons at the bottom, those are actually used to page between them. So you can actually uh, page up to uh, 100 total contacts. Uh, the system's actually also not simply displaying the names, but it's also displaying the presence status of those users. So we've built in the concept of presence into these phones. So uh, if you're accustomed to using something like a Jabber client, an XMPP client, uh, you'll know that people can be available or away, et cetera. This actually allows you to um, broadcast that information through asterisk and relay it out to all the phones using uh, custom device states. And the really neat thing is, is that the setup for all of that is handled automatically, sort of automagically, using the DPMA, or Digium Phone Module for Asterisk. So we'll hit that in a moment. Uh, here's a bit of a feature comparison of the models. 
Um, all three support HD voice, uh, varying number of line keys, of course, and feature keys. The rapid dial slash busy lamp field keys, again, 10 on the uh, mid-level and up to 100 virtually on the, uh, the high-level phone. Uh, it's fast Ethernet for the small and mid-level machines, and it's gigabit. Oh, and by the way, all of those are switched. So you actually can run your PC behind the phone. Um, you can daisy chain the PC into place so you don't have to have a separate network drop at each station. Um, slightly larger display on the, uh, the large system. LCD display panel on the uh, D70, paper on the 50, and um, power over Ethernet across the entire line. Full duplex speakerphone and a whole list of applications, which we will go through very rapidly. Um, again, I mentioned we've got uh, these are programmable soft keys. We'll hit in a moment on how they're programmable, but they're also context aware. So depending on what the application is doing, the function that those buttons uh, actually represent changes. David's just outlined the uh, feature key panel, and we actually have a sort of a, um, uh, a mouse, would you call it, or a, a, you know, a selector controller, as well as the, the fixed feature keys on the phone. Ah, of course, our LCD that I mentioned a moment ago for BLF and for status. OK, integrated applications. Um, many people don't want to have to remember the phone numbers of everybody they know. Everybody out there who has one of these knows that I don't have to remember the phone number for David. I just have to look up David in here and make a call. So we've taken that, and we've actually integrated that directly into the phone. You're able to feed very simply formatted XML to the phones um, that you can generate from whatever application you want, including Elastics, of course. And that will automatically populate the, uh, the contact directory within it. And you can actually have multiple directories. So you could have a corporate directory, a company directory, and then individual directories where you could have your own listings as well. Parking. Uh, parking in asterisk, as you know, has always been a bit of a, uh, a dodgy thing where you have to place a call into extension 700, transfer them to 700, and then listen to hear where they've landed. Uh, and then you'd pick up per, per, perhaps some sort of an announcing system and say, ah, David Duffett is parked at 100. Bob, please pick up extension one, or 701, pardon me. So um, to do that now, you're actually able to park it. It displays on the handset where the uh, phone or where the, uh, the call was parked. And you're able to graphically go through if you've forgotten and find, oh, here's David Duffett. He's parked on slot 703. Status is another thing. I mentioned that we've uh, integrated with uh, presence information. And so you're now actually able to directly see uh, from on the D70, you're actually able to see it on that LCD panel. On the other two phones, there's a status application that you can activate. So if you want to know whether David happens to be busy, available, idle, out at lunch, et cetera, you can simply call up the application and it will display his current status. And that works on the uh, 50 and the 40, both. Visual voicemail. Again, everybody who has a smartphone is accustomed to simply <coughs> playing the messages that they want to and deleting the messages that they don't want to listen to at all. Uh, it's a much simpler, easier, more kind and humane way of doing voicemail. And we've integrated that directly into the phone. So you can go through, see who's called, play the message, pause it, rewind it, fast forward it, and delete it if you don't want to deal with it. So the phones with elastics. Let's talk a little bit about how the integration process works. And here's where we're going to get a bit geeky, a bit into the technical details. So we've actually built automatic provisioning in a really innovative and interesting way. We're using Apple's Bonjour protocol, also called multicast DNS, to do discovery of the phones on the network. So if you're on the LAN where the asterisk uh, server is, is located, the, the phones will automatically locate the, uh, the server. And if you've already got it configured, you can even set it up to do what we call either one or no touch provisioning. In one touch provisioning, if you're setting up phones, you can simply pick through a list of available extensions and say, yes, this is my extension. And the phone provisions itself automatically. No user interaction, no going to the web server, no setting up the usual three-legged race where you've got DHCP servers over here and provisioning servers down there. And you have to reconfigure your network to make it work. It automatically discovers it, lets you select it, and locks that extension into a particular phone. Now, if you're doing a very large deployment, it might be useful to pre-assign phones to particular, Mac, uh, to particular users. And you do that with the MAC address. The phones come with the MAC address barcoded onto the outside of the box and barcoded onto the back. You're actually able to set it up so you simply scan a MAC address into the MAC address for this particular user field within your PBX. And when you deliver the phone, it goes out 
and is automatically handed the proper profile. Absolutely no effort on the part of the user. So you can then just give new employees a phone in a box and they can go do the rest. So just on that thing that Steve was saying about the one touch thing, this is where you plug the phone in, the phone detects the asterisk on the network and says, I found this asterisk, is this the one you want me to connect to? Once you've connected, it gives you a list of the extensions already configured on the asterisk and asks you which, which one you'd like. Now that can be password protected because obviously you don't want people stealing other people's identities, but it also gives rise to a form of hot desking because once the identity is adopted onto this phone, it's taken away from any other phone. So if another phone had that um, profile to start with, it's now lost it until it's taken back by somebody at that phone. So there, there's kind of a, inherently a, a fairly fundamental hot or, or rudimental, <laughs> rudimentary hot desking in the mix. Exactly. So uh, a list of other features, of course, I talked about. And those are all integrated using the same DPMA module that is used to do the, uh, the provisioning. So voicemail, parts calls, et cetera. Uh, other things uh, that are probably worth mentioning, at the moment, the support for the DPMA and uh, all of this magical functionality is available in a couple of different branches of asterisk. It's available in the uh, certified asterisk or CA branch, which is open source GPLv2. It's exactly the same as standard asterisk, except that it gets updated a little bit less frequently and it's got a little bit of additional code that isn't in the mainline branch. And again, if you come back at 6 o'clock, I'll give you all the reasons why we did that and how it works. Um, and the DPMA module itself is a binary add-on because we've got some encryption that's built in that we've got to keep people from being able to sniff passwords out of. Um, but it's available also completely for free, and we're working out a, a distribution agreement so that it can actually be included with every Elastic system. So. Um, We've got a demo kit built right now where all of this is working in Asterisk Now. Now, if you've seen Asterisk Now, it's kind of a poor man's version of Elastix. It doesn't have a lot of the bells and whistles. Uh, but if you're looking for a reference implementation for the DPMA and our phones, this is a great way to go and take a look at it. In fact, we've got an Asterisk Now system running back at our uh, booth. So stop by and take a quick look, and we'll show you how it actually works. Which is 5E10, the booth, right? Yes, that's right. 5E10. So. The other thing that's really interesting about these phones is that starting this fall, and we're going to be making our big announcement of this at Astracon in another three weeks or so, uh, we are going to be offering a JavaScript SDK for the phones. So all of the applications that are on there, you'll actually be able to replace with your own version of that application. So if you wanted to do your own visual voicemail or your own parking, you can do that. You can also create completely new and innovative applications that run directly on the phone. Again, we took many of our cues from the idea of smartphones. People don't want just the factory-built functionality that's baked into the firmware. People want to be able to build their own applications and run their applications on the phone directly. So you can do fascinating new integrations. You can build applications that no one's ever thought of before. And we really think that this is going to change the way the desktop phone market operates. Yeah, and I want to just take a moment to think about that because on the screen, this one unique selling point of the Digium phone allows you to create a million new unique selling points for your system, even to the fact that you could then sell your applications to other people. So this really is rather revolutionary. So we've also recently launched a series of uh, VoIP gateways. Now, as you all know, we've been in the card business since day one. Uh, gateways are a new thing for us, but we decided that what we've done with phones is innovative and exciting, and we need to do the same thing for the VoIP gateway market. VoIP gateways have traditionally been difficult to configure, expensive, proprietary, and generally not something that uh, a normal human being would want to tackle. You almost have to have a PhD in VoIP gateways in order to make them work. We decided to take the same tact that we've taken with some of our other products, the phones and Switchbox, Shouldn't have said that here, I suppose, right. uh, in making it extremely easy. So let's take a little uh, a look at some of the functions and features here. We've got two models right now, a, uh, a single E1 and a dual E1 gateway, so either 30 or 60 channels. Now, this is just the beginning of a new product family, so watch for us to release additional models based on this uh, in coming months. And there have been discussions of adding analog, adding BRI, so we'll have a a much more filled out feature, uh, pardon me, uh, family of products in the, the next few months. But these are innovative because they're built from the ground up to be compatible with Asterisk, to work in Asterisk and Asterisk-based environments like Elastics. Uh, it is a fan-free design. 
Um, it is using uh, an innovative DSP from a company called Octasic, which offloads a lot of the, uh, the horsepower. We're able to build these uh, gateways and sell these gateways much less expensively, or for much less than uh, competing gateway manufacturers out there. It is based on Asterisk. Asterisk is running in the skin of this, uh, but it has a GUI that's built for management. It also has an API. And we'll be releasing the details on the API for the gateways in the next uh, month as well. So you'll be able to do an innovation, innovative uh, deployment which automatically discovers the gateway and automatically provisions it directly from your GUI without making your users go into our GUI. Though if you did, our GUI is beautiful and wonderful. And uh, yeah, I was just about to talk about our GUI very quickly because this is one GUI across the phones, across the gateways, and actually across all of our products. So it's a, very, it's a consistent GUI across the whole range. And of course, in doing these gateways, we recognize that not everybody wants a card-based architecture. Some people want the separate box, and that's why we're here. So the, uh, the first model, the single port model, is uh, 1,195 US. Um, there are separate uh, SKUs available for each of the regions that you see listed there. Um, there's also a, the dual uh, PRI model, which is 1995. And there's also a, an extra part if you need to buy a bracket to mount it. Now, what's neat about these is that they're exactly half of a U-wide. And they're, uh, they're uh, sort of locked together uh, design. So you're actually able to lock two of them together into a single U. So you could have a total of four U on the front side of a rack. And because they're less than half depth, you can actually have four U on the other side. Or pardon me, four ports on the other side as well. So you can get uh, a total of eight ports into one rack U. So here is a common application, of course, PSTN to SIP, where you have um, uh, traditional lines coming in from the telco. Perhaps you had a legacy PBX, and you still need to connect that up to IP PBXs. And of course, there you'd have your elastics boxes tied off of the switch. And the, uh, the gateway actually is able to fail over from uh, the active to a backup. So you can actually have a very simple form of PSTN redundancy uh, built out that way. Now, another application that's fairly common would be SIP to legacy PBX. So if you are running into environments where they're not quite ready to make the move to an elastic system, you can actually go ahead and get them onto VoIP and get them sort of tasting some of the, uh, the, the neat advantages of VoIP by putting um, a gateway in place and then tying that in across E1s in with the legacy PBX, another very common application. And a third application that we see fairly frequently is migration, where somebody has decided that they're going to move off of their legacy PBX uh, but they're not quite ready to throw it out. They're not ready to call in the, the forklift and have it removed. In that case, you can actually build some functions onto an IP PBX, some fun functions into the legacy PBX, and you can let the gateway act as the intermediator, the thing that decides which calls get routed to and from which devices. So call management features, this has all of the things you'd expect from a gateway. Uh, it actually has a lot of the things that you'd expect from a very high-end gateway, but they aren't in your face. You don't have to know everything about PRI in order to make this work. Um, Pass-through support, uh, automatic appending of dial strings. So if you're dealing with a dial, uh, uh, an environment where dialing is a little bit more complex, you can actually adjust the dial strings just as you would with asterisk. But we don't force you to do that. And of course, we're capable of handling faxes and modems and all sorts of legacy analog uh, sort of pass-through signaling as well. Um, it is a gigabit device. Uh, all connections are done via RJ45, so the T1s and, of course, the Ethernet. Uh, onboard echo cancellation. Unlike buying a card where you'd have to buy a separate echo canceller module or steal c cycles from the host CPU, this has integrated onboard absolutely stellar echo cancellation, so a great way of avoiding echo altogether. Uh, auto negotiation of codecs with SIP, of course, and a long list of SIP codecs that are supported. Um, signaling, of course, will handle the U.S. with our T1 uh, protocols. And uh, outside of that, we have E1 protocols for Euro, ISDN, and QSIG. So we've got the whole of the rest of the world covered. And we apologize for having so much T1 information on here. So the US, is U.S. slide. And of course, as David mentioned, the GUI is absolutely gorgeous. It is so much simpler than trying to configure any other gateway. Uh, in fact, we, we have had a number of people that were in our beta program who told us once they had played with the beta gateway, they were really sad to have to go back and use some of the other ones until they were able to, uh, to get production units to start selling. So I think that takes us on to the R series. David, do you want to talk anything about no, this? No, I'll, all right. I'll then. do the cards. <laughs> all right, so the R series uh, is a device for doing redundancy at the physical layer for PSTN connections. 
we actually have, as you can see, two different models, the R800, which does analog, and the R850, which does um, uh, digital, both PRI and BRI. So this is a means of failing over intelligently in the event that a server was to crash. So if the hard drive fails or the power supply fails, you're actually able to have a backup unit that takes control of not only all of the IP connections, but also the physical layer connections, the, uh, the uh, PSTN hardline connections. So if we go on to the next slide and take a, uh, a quick look. OK, Can one more slide, I guess. One? Yeah, let's, let's skip past the part numbers. Oh, wait, I guess I will mention the pricing on that. The boxes are 995 US each for the analog and the digital models. And the ship dates are in the past, so I should have removed that. My apologies. So here is a slide that shows how it works. Here we see the PSTN connecting in to an R-series device. The R-series device is connected up to two asterisk boxes, uh, a primary box over here and a backup over here. Now there's the PSTN connection. So if you had a total of eight spans coming in from the PSTN, you could then have a total of eight spans connecting into cards on each of these boxes. Uh, there's also USB connections which provide power to the R-series and provide control of the R-series. So during normal operation, um, the, uh, the A model, the primary unit over there, is actually handling all the calls. Now, if something was to happen, if the, the A model was to crash, then switch to the next slide, and you'll see what happens. So here we see the A model offline, and we see the heart beating process that's taking place. IP is handled through a series of utilities that I'll mention in a moment. All of the IP traffic gets moved over onto server B automatically. And the USB control on model B tells the R-series to switch all of the PSTN connections over and bring them into the server uh, over here. Now, what this allows you to do is basically set up two inexpensive commodity boxes acting as PBXs. Uh, we've got some utilities which will handle the synchronization of uh, the configuration between the two. And in the event that A crashes, B takes over. Now, B will remain the active box until you repair A and then put A back into commission intentionally, usually by firing it back up, and then you simply fail B, and it'll all fail back over to the A box. And both boxes are set under the, host I, uh, under the virtual IP address, aren't they? Yes, in exactly. In terms of the, it's, it's the SIP registrations. Standard, uh, in fact, here's a number of, uh, of uh, frequently asked questions about them. Um, does require two asterisk servers. You can mix and match between T1, E1, and BRI on the digital model. And of course, analog is all analog. Uh, the system has software that does take care of mirroring asterisk configurations. Now, in integrating that into an Elastics environment will be a little bit of a challenge. But you can do that by using things like, um, oh, MySQL cluster is one mechanism. There's probably a number of others. And I bet uh, somebody clever could go out and very quickly build a, a project to add on a perhaps uh, mod redundancy for, uh, for Elastics that would integrate this very, very cleverly. Um, of course, a couple of, uh, one caveat, if you have G729 that you're running on box A, you'll need to have duplicate licenses right now because there's no way to mirror the licenses and have the licenses fail from one box to the other. There's no GUI on it because it's a very simple system. You simply configure it and it takes care of the, uh, the hard work for you. Um, and at this point, I think what I'm gonna do is pass things on over to David, who is going to talk cards for us. I am going to talk cards, that's right. Here to talk cards. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay, so as you know, Digium has been doing cards that work with Asterisk since the year 2002. That's 10 years worth of card developments. Nobody else has got that history with Asterisk. And we've got a great collection of cards. The newest member of the family that we welcomed recently is this very card. This is the Octal card. Oh, I'll tell you what, yeah. Thanks. So this is the Octal card here, and it's eight PRIs. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking you can only see four connections there, aren't you? Well, each connection, as you can see on the screen, has uh, like a dongle that expands the one RJ45 into two RJ45s. So that's the way we handle the Octal coupling. Um, it's got onboard hardware echo cancellation as an option, and so that really is truly a 240 channel piece of equipment, or up to 240 channels, in a single PCIe slot. Would you care to click, Steve? Thank you very much for that. There's the little dongle, and there are the parts that are available with it. 
And you can see that the pricing is extremely competitive when you compare it with other people's. And of course, every time you buy one of these cards, you're feeding a member of Digium staff, which is you know, a, really, a really nice thing to do. OK. So there is the uh, end of the card that we talked about. And you can see, can you um, get the red laser on the clicky? Oh. There you go, yes. You can see there that they are marked up, so you can see which port is which. And so if you're only using the first four ports, you'd be using just two of the connectors. In, so sorry, you'd be using all, all four of the connectors there. OK, click away, thanks, Steve. So look at this range of cards from one FXS or FXO, so from one single analog channel all the way up to eight PRIs. We've got a card for you any combination along the way as well. And in fact, we can even do a hybrid between analog connectivity and BRI connectivity. Uh, BRI, of course, being very, very popular in mainland uh, Europe. Um, so just thinking analog cards only, anywhere between one and 24 ports of analog connectivity, whether it's FXS to support telephones or FXO to support lines. Looking at the BRI, or ISDN2E, as it's sometimes known, we can cover up to eight BRIs on a single card, so that's up to 16 channels. And then on the PRI card, as I've just explained, we've got the full eight. The full eight. Now, I, I come from a world back in the uh, last few years where cards like this used to cost $10,000 or $20,000. Do you remember that? Dialogic cards and that kind of stuff. Things have changed, and the, these cards are amazingly good value. And of course, and a number of them are available in PCI or PCI Express format. As you know, in telecoms, we tend to kind of be a little bit slow in changing over. And so we don't see PCI Express coming along quite as quickly. But it's pretty much here now in telecom servers. So we are using PCI Express. Steve, you looked as if you might want to say something there. Or? No. Simply to mention that we also have one other card, which is the transcoder card. The transcoding card. Now, of course, as you know, Asterisk is a host media processing machine. It's an engine that runs all of your communications on the host processor, whether that's a Pentium or a Xeon or an AMD chip. But as you probably know, that's a general purpose processor. And general purpose processors are a, a, bit, a little bit like a family car. They can do just about everything. You can take the children out. If you want to put your foot down and go a little bit faster, you can try and do that in a general purpose car. But it's not going to go quite as fast as a racing car. So when you want a racing car for echo cancellation or a racing car for G729, you go to a DSP card. And that's exactly what our transcoding card does. It offloads the work from the host processor onto some specific DSPs. So. In summary, we've got everything that you need for your Elastic solution, whether it's cards, whether it's external gateways, especially the all new Digium phones. And it's here from the people that created Asterisk. Asterisk. So we are the people that know the way the internals of all this work best. Do we have a, a time for questions, do you think? I believe we do. Um, one other announcement before we start the questions. Again, David will be back on stage a little bit Three later this afternoon. Three o'clock for me. All about using elastics through the GUI and under the hood in the command line. And I'll be back at, I believe, 5 to 6, talking about Asterisk 11, the next version of Asterisk, which has some, I think, revolutionary new capabilities and also will be the next long-term support release. So at this point, open it up for questions, please. Do we have a question master anywhere? If not. Has anybody got a question? Yes, sir. In Spanish, eh? In Spanish. Sí, yo quería saber si hay alguna posibilidad de adquirir los nuevos teléfonos en NFR, uno de cada para poder probarlos. Not for resale. One unit of okay, each I... or not for resale is possible. The question was whether it would be possible to get new phones in this year um, in order to try this. We're actually working very hard uh, at getting the new release out that's going to have um, the JavaScript SDK. That will be the first thing that comes out starting in uh, late October. Um, internationalized models that actually have uh, international symbols rather than English language and have firmware that supports 
um, Spanish, and then additional languages will be forthcoming uh, very early in the next year. If you can use the English language versions, you're of course welcome to start piloting uh, development with that, um, but we'll have production models for you in your own language very shortly, as quickly as we possibly can. We know that that's a priority. Yes, sir. Eh, tengo dos preguntas. La primera me gustaría saber cuál es el codec eh, HD que, que utilizan en ese teléfono, si es el G722. Y la segunda pregunta que me gustaría saber si en algún modelo tiene o tienen pensado implementar eh, VPN. I'm afraid I didn't quite catch the first question. I was asking about the, the version of what? Eh, los, sí, los teléfonos que, que nos han enseñado tienen capacidad de sonido HD. Me gustaría saber el codec que utilizas, si es el G722 o es eh, otro diferente. Yes, the, uh, the phones actually are all HD. They all support HD. And they're all G722. That's the codec that's included at this point. Though, of course, it's software, so we can add additional codecs in the future if we wanted to. The other question uh, was related to um, VPN capabilities. And this model does not support VPN. Um, I don't know where cloud. <laughs> um, but we will be looking into adding that for future uh, firmware updates or, or models of phones. We're also looking at the ability to add um, uh, uh, SRTP and SIP TLS, so you can do secure calling even if you don't have VPN capabilities uh, directly on the phone. Eh, sí, hola, buenos días. Eh, he visto que sí, he visto que el teléfono puede ir también alimentado con 5 voltios. Eso significa que puedo conectarlo al USB del ordenador para la alimentación. Um, the question is, can you connect up the phone to, or, or connect the 5 volt power input on the phones to a USB output on a computer and use that as the power source? And that's an innovative question. I've never tried it. Um, the amount of power that's consumed by the phones varies by model. So it's quite possible that it would power the, the small model, the 40, but the uh, 50 or perhaps the 70, which has the additional LCD panel, would require more power than USB normally provides. Now, I, I would say that you can experiment with that. I'm not sure that there's any connector out there that's built right now from the, uh, the uh, power input jack to USB, but fabricating one would be pretty trivial. Sí, no, es, es porque a veces el, el problema que nosotros podemos tener es el número de transformadores que hay que utilizar o caso de que utilicemos POE, eh, que haya que cambiar la electrónica de red. So yes, it, it would, I can see how it would be uh, advantageous to reduce the amount of, uh, of um, clutter that you have under the desk where you have uh, power supplies connecting up. And of course, it's always, it would be nice to be able to do it in situations where you can't switch out for uh, PoE switches because it's prohibitively expensive. It would be a much less expensive solution just to simply connect over to the USB port on your, your phone. I may actually go uh, back and try that when I get home. So give me an, a card and I'll drop you a, a line and let you know how it works. I think, I think I know the reason here. I think this gentleman secretly wants to run a Raspberry Pi off his Digium phone. I think that might be what it is. Any more questions? Are you sure? Okay, you can have the opportunity. Oh, oh we do oh, have oh. another question. Over to you, George. Hi, Steve. Um, my question is, um, do you plan to release a new firmware in the phones to support AX, EX protocol? You know, we looked long and hard at what it would take to put uh, EX, IAX2, into the, uh, the phones, and we decided that the way EX was built, there's a number of things that really make it difficult. It, it, there's no way to load balance uh, EX across a series of devices because of the, uh, the way that the, the protocol is built. So that was one limitation. And the other is that really it doesn't have any mechanism for, for handling uh, all of the feature level implementations you'd need. So you'd have buttons that didn't work and you'd have uh, LEDs that did nothing because there's no BLF concept built into it. So we decided to take a pass on that. EEX really is a very good trunking protocol, but it's not a very good endpoint protocol. So that's why we decided not to go there. Okay, any more? Yes, we do have a question right at the back from Ule. Hello. 
Well, uh, it's great to see the phones, but being the open standards guy, I feel really sad about the open company Digium creating proprietary provisioning protocols and that stuff when we have the SIP forum standards. And from the large sites I'm working with, we're pressing really hard on phone vendors to follow the standards for provisioning on the phones instead of doing their own mumbo jumbo. So why did you go down this road? Thank you, Ule. Well, there's a couple of reasons. The standards have, as far as I'm aware, and I'm not the guy that designed the phones, so I can't speak on their behalf, but in general terms, one, there isn't one standard that anybody else out there is supporting right now. And two, we need to be able to continue to grow our company. I mean, I hate to say this, but there are situations where being proprietary in a very small way is the sort of thing that will continue your company growing, whereas otherwise you'll continue to be sort of s stuck in a rut. And we've, uh, we've experienced that to some degree, and we decided that this is one area where we're not doing harm by being proprietary and where we're actually able to add some value, I think, uh, in a significant way. And I, I hope that doesn't offend. We certainly didn't intend to. Um, and again, we're happy to provide everything for free to use these, but we did want to, uh, to make sure that we weren't giving away the entire farm. And I see the Elastics team nodding with that as well. That's nice. OK, any other questions? OK, well, you will have an opportunity to ask more questions. I'm back here at 3 o'clock. And if you've never tasted English chocolate, I have a free English chocolate for almost everybody that comes along. <laughs> and Steve and I'll be talking about using Elastic through the GUI and under the command line. And then at 6 o'clock, Steve will be back talking about what's coming down the line in Asterisk 11. So thank you very, very much. Thanks.